The Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast is brought to you by the following sponsors. EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com And now, the Iron Game Chalk Talk Podcast. Welcome to Iron Game Chalk Talk with your host, Ron McKeefrey. Every time our athletes walk into this weight room, they're going to be pushed to the max. Let's go! Let's go! Everything you got! On this podcast, hear Coach McKeefrey's straight talk about training, featuring the top strength and conditioning professionals from around the world. And now, here's your host, Ron McKeefrey. Hey guys, welcome back to Iron Game Chalk Talk. I'm your host, Ron McKeefrey, and this is episode number 64. Iron Game Chalk Talk is a weekly podcast where I bring you experts in the field to talk shop. If you have not already done so, please subscribe to us on iTunes or YouTube, or join us on our mailing list at ronmckeefrey.com so that you can stay up to date with the la- um, all the latest episodes as well as anything else that we have going on. This week, very, very excited to have David Joyce, uh, the head strength coach for Western Force Super Rugby, uh, with us. He's also also the author of High Performance Training for Sports. And if you have not gotten this book, this is a game changer. This is a very great book. Um, I'm going through, and and, um, I'm about halfway through it. It's just a a fantastic resource where he's collaborated with some of the best strength coaches in the the world and, uh, and wrote a text and... And it's really done very, very well. So uh, make sure you check that out. We talk about his journey into strength and conditioning. Uh, we met back at the UK SCA conference when I spoke there. Uh, that's a fantastic event. And, and obviously we've been able to uh, develop a friendship from that and, and uh, just a fantastic strength coach. But, you know, we talk about his journey. We talk about programming for rugby. We talk about the book. And uh, just a a great conversation that could have gone on for hours and hours and hours. And so uh, I know you're really going to enjoy this episode. Before we do, we want to make sure we recognize our sponsors, IgnitionAPG.com and EliteForm.com. If you've not done so, uh, make sure you go and you like their Facebook page. um, And so you can stay up to date with the latest things they got going on. I mean, they're in some of the top programs in the country and just have fantastic products um, from their strength planner to their um, power tracker and the whole deal. And, and so uh, you get a free trial um, for, for the paperless system and the uh, strength planner uh, by going to IGCT at EliteForm.com. Just send them an email, uh, tell them how much you appreciate them being a part of the show, and uh, get that free trial. And it's, like I said, it makes things, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, Spending hours and hours on an Excel spreadsheet, it makes it very easy to be able to push workouts uh, to your athletes. Lastly, if you've not gone to strength-ondemand.com, strength-ondemand is a um, online archive of strength and conditioning clinic presentations that myself and Rob Taylor put together. Uh, it's 50 plus strength and conditioning presentations. Uh, so basically a clinic in your pocket that you can watch anytime and on your time. And we're actually going through a, um, a redesign of this, of this program. We're going to be adding lots of content here pretty soon. And so I'd encourage you to go and join while it's still only, I think it's $97 right now. Um, but $97, the cost of one clinic for 50 plus presentations, uh, is well worth it. And, um, I've gotten nothing but positive, positive feedback about it. So check that out. Strength on demand.com. And uh, I know you'll enjoy that. So sit back, enjoy this episode, go out, get this book, uh, High Performance Training for Sports, and uh, take lots of notes. We'll see you on the other side. Take care. All right, guys. Very, very excited to have David Joyce with us. Uh, David, I met, golly, it's probably, what, five years ago at this time, mm-hmm. about this time, over at the UK SCA. And it's just a, it's just a fantastic example of how, um, you know, you get the opportunity to meet people from all over the world and, 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 and interact and you never know where those relationships are going to take. And, you know, David and I reconnected and, and uh, he's got a fantastic book out that we'll talk about, but man, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited you're on brother. Uh, thanks very much, Ron. Um, listen, I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be on, uh, on here today. It's, it's been such a, a huge journey since I first met you way back when in, 
in uh, in England and and really pumped to to be joining you today. Well, you know, and, and you're up early, bright and early. It's it's uh, what seven a.m. over there right now. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's an early start. It's an so, early start. <laughs> but I appreciate you getting up, man. I'm, I'm excited to jump into this with you. But you know, for everybody that you know that that hasn't uh, got an opportunity to read your book yet and get to know you a little bit better. Uh, go into your journey, you know, where did you start, what kind of what was your motivation into getting into strength and conditioning, and then obviously how you've gotten to where you're currently at. Mm. Um, okay, so my background is both as a strength coach and a, a sports physiotherapist, so my first degree was as as a physio, but all the way along I knew that my my interest, rather than in manual therapy, my interest and skills lay in exercise therapy. So I've always been in strength coaching and athletics coaching, and my background was in Australian rules football um, as well. So I I did all my qualifications in, in physiotherapy and, and sports physiotherapy masters, and then did a, a masters in strength and conditioning as well. Um, and, you know, picking up all my badges all the way along. So I've been, you know, as with all of us, you know, the the qualifications are fine, but it's the people that you meet and spend time with and the, the athletes that you get to work with that groom who you are as a as a coach, as a person. And so I'd say that my my journey really has been shaped by by going to conferences and meeting people like yourself and Dan Baker and, and all the greats of our industry and and taking little bits from each of them rather than any particular one person. You you're you're a product of all the people that you meet and all your experiences and I've been lucky enough to have worked in in the English Premier League with the, the British Olympic team at in the Beijing Olympics, with the Chinese Olympic team at the London Olympics, um, with a, a football club in, in Istanbul called Galatasaray, which is a, a huge football club there, madness, but great. And then um, finally I was really fortunate to be offered the role as head of athletic performance at Western Force, which is um, one of the clubs in the Super Rugby competition. It's based in Perth in Western Australia and... We are the most travelled team in world sport. Our, our closest away match is four and a half hour flight uh, away, which obviously means it's a four and a half hour flight back. So we've got significant hurdles that we need to be able to jump to be able to compete with the big boys in that competition. And um, yeah, so that, that's that's kind of my my role at the moment. And I, I lecture on the uh, Masters of Strength and Conditioning course at Edith Cowan University and. Um, yeah, just a, a lifelong learner like yourself. That's well. That's what it's all about, isn't it? And that's that's you know we talk about being a a technician, a great technician, being a great manager, learning how to manage people, resources, and time, and all those things. But uh, it's also being entrepreneurial and 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 constantly challenge yourself to strive to uh, continually learn. And and I know we both share that, so that's that's awesome. Talk talk a little bit about. Um, you know the fact that you've bo- you're both a physio and a strength and conditioning coach, and how that's kind of shaped, uh, you know, both your career and kind of your programming. I, I think a lot of physios or athletic trainers uh, tend to have the reputation as being handbrakes. They're always thinking about what you can't do. So if someone's injured, oh, they can't do this or they can't do that. Whereas I think what I've got and my background and those that share my background do have is an ability to think okay, well, what is it that the athlete can do? Right. Um, certainly as physios, you're not taught about strength. The physios are, are commonly caught giving three sets of eight um, body weight squats and going, oh, well, these are going to strengthen up your quads. And I think what having my background as a strength coach gives me is an ability to really program from a performance perspective rather than a medical perspective. Right. I find sometimes the medical perspective is too safe, too... Um, um, yeah, it's probably just too safe. It's it, rather than trying to push for performance, and and ironically, sometimes when you try and be too safe and not um, put the athlete at uh, and really extend the athlete, all you're doing is a disservice, and you're not exposing them to the the sorts of forces that they would get in their sport. Sure. And in actual fact, therefore, you're being unsafe. And I think what having that knowledge of pathology gives me is a really good understanding of, of where we need to go with that particular injury. But being a strength coach gives me a really good indication of where we need to be from a performance perspective. Um, and I think that's they're, they're pretty natural bedfellows, really. And I wouldn't say 
um, that I'm the world's best strength coach. I certainly wouldn't say I'm the world's best physio, but what I think I do have is an ability to understand both sides of things and have good conversations with with um, with people that are the best, you know, and and pick little bits from each person. So I think that's a it's a it's a great background for me, I believe. No, no, I agree 100. percent And, and it, you know, so many times that that role or that relationship, especially you know here in the United States, could be an adversarial type of relationship. And yeah. the reality is, is that you you can't have it's like your right hand without your left hand. You gotta you gotta have both um, so that you can do the best service for your athletes. That's ultimately what it comes down to. Yeah, look, you're absolutely right, and there's there's a lot of thoughts at, in Australia and the UK and the States, obviously, as well, that, oh, well, the strength coaches break them and then the physios fix them, and, and that's a really flawed approach. It's a, it's a terrible approach, um, and a lot of teams have it, and, and you see they're the teams that have high injury rates or you know not successful seasons because it's effectively a dysfunctional team, mm-hmm. whereas... Certainly at the force, we don't have a medical team, we don't have a strength and conditioning team, we have a performance team and the, the, the sports meds, the, the physios and the doctors, look at the athlete from their background and their perspective and they're involved with the training athlete as much as the S&C coaches are involved from day zero of the injured athlete. Right. Well, I think that, you know, that, that high performance model, you know, the performance team model is, is such something that we, we should all strive for because that's, you know, to have the input with the coaching staff to use science and, and technology to really drive your programming um, and um, you know, come from that approach I think is, is critical, you know, to having ultimate success. Yeah, and that's, that places the athlete in the middle and, um, and then he's got his support team around him rather than having – you know, whispers in dark corners from the S and C team saying, "Oh, the physios are not allowing you to do this," and right. all that creates is disharmony, and and the athlete doesn't know where it is. Rather than just having a unified team opinion, because you've got people that understand each other. Well, you know, that's that's you know, that's one difference that I've seen from you know with strength and conditioning around the world. What are what are some other differences that you've seen? Um, you know, because I mean, you're well traveled, English Premier League and Australia and, and, and England and the whole deal. What What are some of the biggest differences you see from country to country? Um, I think I've probably picked up more differences maybe a decade ago than what you do now, and it's I, I think because because of the internet, because of podcasts like this, because of um, cheaper travel, people are actually getting out more and spending more time in other facilities. So we have. We have Brits come and spend time with us. We have Americans come spend time with us. I go across to the States. I go across to England. And so there's a real melding of, of ideas now and philosophies. So I don't think it's as, as stark a contrast as what it was maybe 10 years ago. What I would say in the States overall, and this is going to not win me too many friends elsewhere, but overall I think there is a a greater emphasis on coaching skill in America. So I think the some of the world's best athletic coaches um, are unbelievable coaches. Mm-hmm. I think what the um, the Brits and the Aussies are particularly good at is the sports science side of things. Sure. And then you get the the people that are the world's best. You know yourself, Dan Baker. These are the people that are. Understand the science, but also understand the individual, and it's the key to understanding the individual that is the that makes the world's great coaches. Um, but in essence, there's world's great coaches from the US, from Australia, from New Zealand, from South Africa, from France, from Norway, from all over the show. But I think um, overall, I would say there seems to be a greater emphasis on coaching skill in America and there seems to be a greater emphasis on scientific rigor in the UK and, and Australia. But that's that's being unfair on those individuals that are unbelievably well, good there's, by there's definitely examples of of a lack of either in either country and, and, and obviously examples of Absolutely. excellence in in, in in multiple countries and I think what you said early on is is was right on point with, you know, the the borders are shrinking, aren't they? I mean, it's the yeah. world is getting so small, and it's so neat to be able to sit on a podcast and talk to a guy halfway around the world and and uh, and get better. And, and I know that we both share that 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 passion for um, 
you know, having a global approach to strength and conditioning and, and really learning and, and, and getting an opportunity to interact with various uh, strength coaches. Yeah. And certainly, you know, with, with this book that we've, we've published, there are, there are American coaches, there are Australian coaches, New Zealand coaches, British coaches, um, French coaches in there. So there's, there's, there's people around the world because what you do is you try and um, handpick the people that you believe are unbelievably good, at, irrespective of what their passport tells you. Absolutely. 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 Well, you mentioned Edith Cohen, you know, early on, and I think that's such a, a unique and, and great program. And, you know, talk a little bit about that that program that you're you know you're a part of, and and you know where maybe you see you know some of the best research and and ideas coming from right now. Um, Edith Cowan University is based here in Perth, and it's a terrific university. It's um, one that is particularly particularly strong in strength and conditioning. So the the actual Masters of Strength and Conditioning course is run by um, uh, Dr. Greg Huff, who last week was voted as president of the NSCA, so that's yep. a that's a huge thing for for our university, and we've got some terrific people. Dan Baker is there, Sophia Nymphius is there, Jeremy Shepherd is there, so some real real um, big guns all contribute to the course. I think the the strength of the course is the fact that it is very uh, applied based, very practical based, um, and it, it, what it also means is that. Because it's primarily distance learning, right? Uh, it opens it opens the borders, like we were saying. So we've I, I have students from the states. I've got students from China. I've got students from all over the world, um, from a variety of backgrounds. I've got a, a guy from Real Madrid, and you know a, a huge variety of backgrounds. And my concluding lecture at the at the um, the masters when we get together for a two week intensive is. Sure, the masters. The best thing about a masters is not the information that you get, despite the fact that being great. The best thing about the masters is the people that you meet. Interaction, yeah. A hundred percent. You know that it's the relationships that sustain you through our industry and and get you jobs and and enable learning and and all those sorts of things, which is how we connect. You know, and um, and the, the great thing is because there are people from all over the world, you, you're getting an influx of ideas from all over the world. So certainly in my the units that I teach, I try and um, bring evidence-based uh, training and practice, but with a real feel for the things that I've seen over the world, whether it's in China or whether it's in, in the UK or, or Australia as well. And I think that's the, the thing that people really like about the course. I agree, and it's uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's it's a it's mostly distance learning, but there are uh, uh, two week intensives or two you yeah, know, that's gap right. of time yeah. that you get together and and interact, and, and I think it's really unique. And, and like you said, um, what a great melting pot of minds from all over the world coming together and, and interacting and, and talking shop. And that I mean, that's got to be one of the best two week gaps in anybody's year for uh, sure. It's 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 unreal, Ron, and the the reason I teach on it is because I want to learn. Yeah. The reason you teach is because you want to learn. And um, you you get to spend time with these people and you get to – one part of me feels that I'm actually giving back to the profession that's given me so much and, you know, trying to pass it forward. But equally, on a on a more selfish level, you, you go, right, well, what is it that I can learn from this guy from Real Madrid or what is it that I can learn from – Greg Huff today, or, or or whatever it is, you know, and I'm just so fortunate that it's down the road from us, and our our players utilise their facility a lot because, you know, it's world class, and we we utilise the expertise there because it's world class, and sure. you know, we're we're pretty fortunate, you know. Uh, absolutely. Well, you know, I want to get into uh, you know programming for for rugby, you know, and and so can you can you kind of lay out the the annual plan, you know, just kind of what are the seasons and and, you know, maybe number of days of training versus conditioning, those types of things? Yeah, well, um, so we <laughs> we lost on the weekend, which knocked us out of the finals, unfortunately. So what we've done is we've given the lads two weeks break. They then come, we've got a secondary competition called the, the NRC, which we are entered in. So our lads will play that, so nine-week competition and then finals after that. Um and then they'll have five weeks off, and then they go into pre-season. So pre-season will start November. Our first trial match will be 
in uh, January, and then uh, competition matches, so um, competitive matches for points, will start in February, and that goes through till July. So it's actually the the super super rugby season is reasonably short. There's only sixteen games. Um, and then finals on top of that, but interspersed, you've got international matches and right. and um, the like. So it ends up by being a year round sport, like yeah. like all the big sports, I suppose, around the world. In terms of a weekly plan, it for us because we're so um, limited by our travel, uh, it will depend on whether we're playing home or away. It will depend on whether we're having to fly from from Perth to South Africa or Perth to to New Zealand because that obviously tells us so much of our time we're going to be in the air or recovering from being in the air. Right. Um, but on a standard week from Saturday to Saturday, if we were playing two consecutive games at home, we would have a Saturday match. Sunday would be recovery. So because our guys travel so much and we know that family time and home time is so important, I'll only get the injured players in on the Sunday for review. Um, Other than that, they go through their recovery protocols themselves. They need to accrue 100 points. So we've got a 100-point recovery system, which I can talk about later. Yeah. Um, The Monday will be a lot of meetings with coaches, will be screening, will be a light flush and a a bit of a, a, a lighter run going over some of the lessons that we learned from the previous game. Tuesday is the big day, so we will tend to train in the morning and then have recovery in the afternoon and then another training session in the afternoon. Okay. In the morning, it will be a team session, so forwards and backs combined, and in the afternoons, they tend to split up, so the, the backs will train and then the forwards will train. Whilst the backs are training, the forwards are in the gym. Whilst the forwards are training, the backs are in the gym. Gotcha. The Wednesday tends to be a training free day, which is the recovery day for rehab and, and regeneration and the like. Thursday will be a faster day, but a single session. Uh, Friday will be a captain's run, so that is a, a shorter, sharper session whereby the um, we just go through plays and we, it's a confidence thing before the match on Saturday. Right. In terms of um, lifting, in season, we will do an upper body lift on uh, Monday. We'll do a lower body lift on a Tuesday. We will do a combo lift on a Thursday, and then um, some guys do a, might might do a light pump on the on the Friday prior to a match, but not too many of them. Right. Well, what do you you know? So that's a that's an in season. What's a what's an off season or you know pre season kind of look like? A, a pre season. Yeah. We we structure it according to blocks. So we'll we won't do the same pre season for. The, the whole 13 weeks of pre-season, we'll, we'll divide it into groups of two or groups of three, and, and depending on the emphasis of that, will depend on what the, will we'll shape what the, the week looks like. Mm-hmm. The, the, the start of pre-season is very much about athletic development, developing resilience, re- developing robustness, um, earning the right to run fast, which is a, a big thing we talk about in our, our organisation, earning the right to run fast, so accruing the miles, accruing increasing speed in the legs to protect against hamstring injuries, for example. Um, and then as we go um, through pre-season, there's much more of a contact focus and then much more of a learning focus and, and the like. Um in terms of lifting during the week in the pre-season, it's pretty heavy. You know, we'll do we'll do two uppers, we'll do two lowers, um, and there'll be combos in there as well. So the the boys will be lifting four to five times uh, a week. Last year, what we did was we had a seven week block of pretty much uninterrupted athletic development, and we were we were getting the guys to lift morning and afternoon um, okay. on a number of days during the week, and that was probably the one of the biggest influences in our successful season this year was was actually getting the guys to spend quality time improving their body, which they just never do because they're playing so much. Right. Um, whereas we mandated last year that, no, they were going to stay with us and they were going to lift and they were going to lift heavy. Initially, I was the most hated man in Perth because I, <laughs> I, stopped, I stopped them you know, going back to their, their homes or whatever, but... Um, Quite rapidly, they saw that they were improving and improving in ways that they hadn't done since they were 17, you know. And right. 
Um, and, and when competitive athletes get to chase a rabbit, that's when you get um, people on board. And, There's no doubt. and the, tra- the train just picked up speed and, and boys were lifting heavier than ever before. They were getting faster. You know, we, were, we don't talk too much about strength training, although that's a key focus. We talk about athletic development. So some guys have got a very strong strength development um, focus, whereas some people need uh, much more of a power focus. Some guys need a speed focus. Some guys need a rehab focus. So whatever it is of their individual needs, that's what they get programmed for rather than a a generic program that everyone is shoehorned into. We try and fit the program around the individual. So in that, in that seven week gap there, you know, you're bringing them back twice, you know, twice a day or training them twice a day. What, what did that normal, was that, you know, was it a lift in the morning and a run in the afternoon or was it two lifts or what, what did a normal, what's a normal day look like? So generally speaking, we'll lift in the afternoon and that's um, a bit of that's for, for risk mitigation. So trainings, we like to be fast and intense. So when I say um, training, I mean um, uh, practice. And so what what we've found is that our our injury risk profile substantially lifted if if we were doing heavy leg sessions and then getting them to run fast. um, It's not something that Usain Bolt would do. It's probably not something that we should get our outside backs to do. So... Um, our forwards tend to be a little bit more resilient. They don't get up to the same high speeds as our backs. So I'm quite happy for them to lift it and then, and then train. But our backs tend to be a little bit more, um, uh, uh, they're, they're more fast twitch profile athletes. Sure. So they always lift last. The exception to that will be in pre-season um, where we'll often want them lifting when they're fresh mm-hmm. and, so they, they will have a lower speed session in the afternoon. So, again, it depends on what the, the aim of the program is, and that's why it's critical to have a, a really good conversation with your head coach and to be planning with your head coach so he doesn't have the wrong expectation of how fast a team practice is going to be in the afternoon because you've just gone um, max deadlifting, for example. That's right. That's right. So if it was a, a, an upper body lift and they walked into the weight room, are, are they going through some prehab? Are they going through any correctives? What, what's the normal session look like? Yeah. When they come in in the morning, they will, they will screen with the, the medical guys. Um, they'll have a look at their particular factors that we're interested in. So it might be a sit and reach or someone with an Achilles tendinopathy. They might, might have to do their hot test or whatever. Right. They then have a period of what, what we call robustness time where they work on their own individual correctives. Um, in that time, they might be foam rolling. They might be doing rotator cuff work. They might be doing some, some hip mobility drills or, or whatever it is. Um, and then when we, um, when we lift, so the music's off for for uh, warm up because warm up is about you know really honing into the technique of what you're trying to do. So there might be some overhead squats, there might be um, some some light plyo stuff, there might be some some hamstring work in there. And then once we're satisfied that the boys are warmed up, not just physiologically but cued into the lifting session. The, the session will start, and that's when the, the tunes start, and that's when um, the boys are in, and they lift hard, they lift heavy, and um, and then they're out of there. Um, an upper body session will typically comprise of a push and a pull, um, and and variations thereof. So we're we're very big on making sure that the athlete is symmetrical. Sure. Um, and so there'll, there'll be double arm, there'll be single arm, there'll be some torso strength work as well. Um, it'll be horizontal push, horizontal pull, as well as vertical pull and vertical push. Um, uh, similar to American football, rugby is a multi-planar sport. So they need to be strong and resilient in, in not just all planes, but combinations of those planes as well. So we do a lot of rotation work as well. You mentioned you mentioned earlier you know your hundred point recovery system. I'd like to hear more about that. Um, what we've found is that rather than mandating you must do ice baths, you must do wear compression socks, you must do this, you must do that. We know from hormonal profiling studies that the it's better to have a menu because what is 
the best recovery strategy for Ron McKeith, or he might be very different to what the best recovery strategy for David Joyce is, and it's it's folly to assume that we're the same. So you may love a massage, but for me, I hate a massage, and therefore all that does is spike my cortisol levels, which is inhibitory to recovery. So therefore what we do is we don't mandate, we say, you do need to accrue 100 points for recovery. You get 25 points for nine hours sleep. You get 25 points for uh, return to um, pre-match weight and, and nutrition. And then you've got a raft of options that might be worth 25 points or 10 points or, or whatever it is, and you need to build up your menu so you, you accrue 100 points. And that might be compression stockings, it might be massage, it might be doing a flexibility session. Interestingly, what we've found is that the hormonal profiling for guys that do things individually is not quite as effective or as, as advantageous as it is when you're doing it with your mates. Sure. So you do get... You get 10 points for doing a flexibility session or a, a, a beach recovery session by yourself, but you get 20 points if you do it with three or more people because that what what that power of social interaction gives you is is a flood of happy chemicals, right. which is vital for your recovery. So that accrues more points. And the, the other thing is if you get on the booze, that's minus 25 points. So as soon as a... a a sip of beer touches your lips, bang, you've got to find another 25 points from somewhere. That's great. That's great. So the, how do you how do you present that to the athletes? Is that on a poster somewhere? Is it Yeah, yeah, we've got um, we've got lots of posters around the place with the, the boys doing silly things and saying it's a postage stamp saying 25 points and someone's <laughs> Someone's freezing their ass off in a in an ice pool, and and they, they get twenty five points. And there's a picture of that stuck around, and the boys are pretty good with it, you know. And yeah. um, a lot of it get requires buy in, and we we encourage the players to to drive that. So we're we're happy to be the shepherds, but they are responsible for their their own um, their own practice. So we set the outcomes that we want. We show them the map. We show them. The, the best way to get there, and we will shepherd them, but they are expected to drive that system because ultimately we can't get out there and pass the ball and, and kick the goals for them right. on the pitch. So they need to develop that inner sort of drive. And we've got a terrific bunch of blokes um, at, at Western Force, uh, Ron, and so the, the, we don't have too many problems. Occasionally you get a couple of guys that are forgetful or or try and steal the milk from your tea, as an old coach of mine would say, but um, <laughs> ultimately they are, they're they very, very good, and we've got a strong leadership group that will will enforce those things as well. Well, that makes a difference. But, you know, obviously playing off of their competitive nature to try to accomplish a task helps as well, and I, I really like the idea of that. Yeah, and I think the other thing that helps too is is showing them that, well, we're giving you a menu. You, you've yeah, just got to you got a choice. That. Yeah, 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 and that that makes them central to the process. No, no doubt, input psychology. Obviously, you know, if they have input into the program, they feel they have more ownership of it as well. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned, you know, the, the similarities between rugby and football. You know, when you when you're evaluating, and you've gone overseas or or, or whatever. And your research, and what what have you pulled from American football, and then vice versa? What what have you said? You know what? If American football did some of this, maybe that would help them out as well. Um, I think what the the American football model is 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 kind of different to ours in a lot of ways. The sport is is brutal, like our sport is brutal. Our guys um, will run. Um, Ten kilometres in a match, dependent on dependent on the the person, right. and um, and we'll have multiple efforts and and those sorts of things. American football will tend to run less overall, but have explosive efforts that um, are probably more than what what our guys would do, because you can't you can't run a, a ten second hundred if you've got the veil of fatigue of running ten k's behind you. Sure. Um, what I think American football does unbelievably well is work on uh, acceleration mechanics and and agility mechanics. Yeah. And you know, the, the part of it is natural to the guys, 
but part of it is just the, the the terrific coaching that they get, you know. And I've seen some of your stuff, and it's it's unbelievable. So I try and pull as much of that sort of stuff as I can, uh, and and use in our program. And I've been lucky enough to to um, do a, quite a bit of work with athletes' performance and exos over the years, and used a, a lot of well, some of some of their their methodology as well, and um, and a lot of that is based on the NFL Combine work and. Um, and so a combination, like uh, I've got to say, the best coaches, the best coaches are thief. And so the, the best coaches are always trying to take things from other programs and see how it applies to their group of athletes. And so there's things that we do in our program, agility wise, that you would recognise from, you know, videos that you've posted and um, and the like. In terms of what what we do, I think what rugby rugby does very well is. Um, Generate neck strength because because of the scrum, the um, the forces that go through the neck and the spine are so great that you know, we just get the guys get concussed all the all the time or they get really bad neck problems if they weren't strong through the neck. So we've got a a, a very good evidence based neck training program involving low load and high load work isometric eccentric concentric and and what we call shock g or snap g uh whereby the the players are having to control their own heads uh against gravity a a sudden change in gravity which is something that i've taken from formula one um and i think i think that's that's something that that rugby probably lead the world in and the other thing that we're very good at is um utilizing gps Yep. So how we program on the back of GPS is is as good in rugby as it is anywhere in the world, I believe. Talk, elaborate a little bit on you know the shock G and the snap G, or just your basic programming for the neck and trap area over over the course of a week. Um, we'll tend to do this um, in the middle part of the week, and particularly on a Wednesday if that's a training free day, and so. Um, we'll, we'll have guys, so typically they'll come in to, to me and they'll be lying, let's just say, on, the, on, the, on a, a bench on their back with their shoulders at the tip of the bench and I'll hold their head and they'll close their eyes and I'll put their head into a particular position, whether it is um, left lateral flexion or flexion or extension or whatever, mm-hmm. and then I'll just move their head around until they're, they're um, neck muscles are relaxed, and then I'll drop the head. Now, obviously, the head weighs three kilos or so. Some of our guys, their heads weigh a lot more, and some of them weigh a lot less. <laughs> um, and and they need to be able to catch their neck or catch their head. And so what we've found is that guys that get repeated stingers or burners in their shoulders, if they get repeated concussions, they're really slow with this. So they, they will let their head snap back and before they catch it. So... What I believe in is with neck strength, it's not just the strength, maximal force that you can apply that's critical, it's your rate of force development. Yeah. Um, and so doing those sorts of things and then you get them doing it in sideline and in, in um, prone as well, those things are working on their ability to generate force and to stop force. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, and then, then, then they'll do that wearing a helmet. We don't wear helmets in our sport, but um, we'll get them to wear a helmet or or whatever. And um, and that's been really big for us, really, really helpful for us. No, it's very interesting. You know, you mentioned uh, you know some of the, the combine test early on, and you know what, what from from both an evaluation standpoint of, of looking at athletes coming in, but also from a, a, an annual uh, reviewing your performance training. You know, and and, and accountability there you know what are some of the tests that you guys specifically look at and do testing for us is something that we we do a lot of um during the week because we 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 set the loads and therefore we can see how people are going we do have set testing periods and they are they're designed to keep the athlete accountable Mm-hmm. And to and to tell us where they are in in equal measure, I would say. The repeated running test that we use is a yo-yo test, and um, uh, the reason we use that is not necessarily because it's the best test, um, because there are great tests out there, the thirty fifteen intermittent shuttle and the like. 
The reason we use it is because we've used it for so long, we have got such a bank of data that we know what good looks like. Right. So we use that for a repeated running test, and we use both the Yo-Yo 1 and Yo-Yo 2. Um, we find with Yo-Yo 1, it's more suited to the the, the fitter, more endurance-based athletes, so our, our backs. Um, and the, the Yo-Yo 2 gets really quick, really fast. And so that will that will drop out the big guys quite quickly, not because they don't have the um, the aerobic capacity to do it, but just because it gets too quick for them. Sure. Um, we look at speed testing, so um, zero to ten for the guys that don't do the the high volumes of running, and then the um, the zero to forty for the outside backs that need to be quick, both in acceleration and top end speed. Mm-hmm. In terms of strength, we, we, we look, we're pretty basic, you know. We we look at bench press, bench pull, and we look at ratios of those. We look at um, squat and deadlift. We look at vertical jump, and we look at reactive strength index as well, so to see how quick someone is, like, with their amortization phase. Mm-hmm. Um, they've got a, a series of resilience tests that they need to be able to do, and so a, a, a Bering Sorensen, which is a lumbar spine endurance test, they need to be able to hold that for two minutes. They need to be able to do glute ham raises, four sets of 10. They need to be able to um, demonstrate that they can do 30, uh, no, sorry, 40 calf raises, which is all fairly basic stuff, but this is for entry into the program. This is for us to say, yes, you're safe to be able to train. You're, you're robust enough. Um, they need to be able to hula hoop, believe it or not, because we've <laughs> found that we've found that with um, guys that have got the motor skill to be able to hula hoop and, and hold a hula hoop for, up for, for two minutes without just muscling it up don't tend to get back pain. And the reason for that is they're just skillful movers. Um, so if you come into our facility, you'll see guys hula hooping, which is kind of bizarre. And I get a lot of odd looks for guys that are new to our program, but guys that are used to me now uh, understand the, the benefits of it. And so they, they do that. There's a, there's a protocol that they need to do there. There's a curriculum. Um, and then we look at um, uh, gait proficiency and landing proficiency from a jump as well, so looking at how well they can dampen their impulse. So there's a, there's a number of things. A lot of them are um, generic for the entire group because we recognise them as competencies that any rugby player, any uh, elite athlete should be able to cope with, but then there are individual competencies based on deficiencies or based on needs of that position as well. Absolutely. Well, you know, I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, I want to talk about the book, you know, High Performance for Sports. Unbelievable, unbelievable book. And, uh, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm a halfway through it, and I can already say that. And you guys did a fantastic job. But I want to, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, your motivation for being, you know, for the project and, and you know, how you were able to get such great people like Franz Bosch and Joel Jamison and Dan Baker and everybody to contribute uh, chapters to it. Oh, mate, listen, that's um, – a lot of people have said nice things about it, but to, to hear you say those sorts of things is oh, – uh, that's – look, that's, it honestly is. It's, it's such a – it's a big thing for us. Um, the, the project was um, – we came up with it simply because there's a lot of textbooks out there that are research-based or based on individuals – thoughts um, and they're all great in their own way but what we wanted to do was have a, a series of master classes and so I, I, my, my concept was let's create the world's best conference and um, but just in book form so you can access it at any time so we came up with all the things that we thought were uh, things that coaches on the ground need to know so whether it's anaerobic like training for anaerobic capacity or training for strength or or then we thought, well, a lot of them are covered in other books, so how can we make it flow into a high-performance model? So we've got a, a chapter there from Derek Hansen on tra- how you translate strength from the weight room into speed because ultimately there's very few sports that win games on the back of a bench press. That's it's right. speed that happens. That's it's right. speed that changes games. So um, how, how do you do that? And it's... So it's, a, it's an applied book. It's, it's a series of the world's best coaches giving their thoughts on the best way to train a particular uh, aspect of performance. So if, um, if Dan Baker, if, if you employ him for your organisation as a consult, 
what would he say about strength coaching? How would he um, how would he try and change your program, or how would he give advice about your program? That's all in the book there, and it's written in that sort of language. It's not written um, like Joyce 2010 said this in his review of um, 30,000 studies on on um, sedentary college students. It is all about these guys work with the best in the world. What is it that they think, and how do they apply their wisdom? Oh, I can attest to that. that it, it, yeah. It's not, and, and, it's not an easy that, read in that it's not an easy read in that your your highlight. I tried, you know, I'm I'm a highlighter. I go through and I underline yeah. everything, and, and I, you know, I get through the first couple of chapters, and I got pretty much the whole chapter underlined. So it's not an easy <laughs> read like that, but it's an easy read in that you're really it is conversational type of uh, a tone, and um, you really feel like you're talking to Dan Baker or Joel Jamison or David yeah. Joyce, you know, and, I, and I really appreciated that. And that, that was the great thing, you know, we, we, um, that was the brief that we gave the authors and, and we selected the authors, the, the contributors that can communicate in, the, in that way and, and that was so critical for us. So it had to be something which um, you can read once and apply something immediately but was of sufficient depth that, that it would rep- reward repeat readings. No, absolutely. It, it's, it, it's fantastic. What, you know, it, for... It's written for both a, a veteran strength coach going through and, and, and a, a strength coach that's just starting as well. And so what, what were some of the biggest takeaways that you, you would say for, you know, the, the advanced strength coach reading it? And, you know, what, what are some of the biggest takeaways for the, the strength coach just starting out? The, look, I, I reckon Franz Boss's chapter on um, um, dynamic systems and, and how you change your training um, profile and training emphasis to to really develop skill was outstanding, and it took me uh, honestly probably fifteen reads to to get it to and, and edits to get it to where it is now. Um, but that that's that's really really important for the veteran strength coach. Um, mm. And and similarly, you know, the great thing about veteran strength coaches is they they understand the more you, they understand that the more you know, the more you don't know. That's right. So just refreshing ideas is, is really helpful as well. Um, I reckon Sophia Nymphius's Sophia Nymphius's chapter on agility, where it looks at not just the mechanics but the decision making and the cognitive aspect of of agility, is is really great. And Jeremy Shepard's chapter on on jumping and landing work is is critical as well. For the for the rookie strength coach, um, I reckon going through some of the wisdom with um, with programming from Ben Rosenblatt from the British Olympic Organisation is is um, sensational. I reckon the movement of, movement efficiency chapter from from Craig Ranson is really good. Mm. Look, they're, they're, I don't I really don't think there's a weak chapter in there, and Not at all. it will and it depend on the emphasis of that individual coach as to what they'll get most out of, but. Um, what we've tried to highlight is little sections of wisdom in each chapter that that a that a coach can apply immediately, and they should apply to the veteran or the rookie as well. Yeah, well, you you hit it, you know the nail right on the head early on in the, in the, in uh, the episode, in that you've got to find great mentors and surround yourself with people if you have any desire to go on in this business, you know. And and you've been uh, you know. Uh, fortunate to have that in your life. I've been fortunate to have that in my life, and and obviously, you know, by books and conferences and things along those lines, yeah. you can continue to to do that. And what, what give me a, a piece of advice that uh, you know, a, a profound piece of advice that a strength coach has given you that's really kind of helped shape your career. Uh, the, our, the the one thing that always sticks in my mind is that athletes don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Yeah, it, it's. It's really important, you know, and that's that's fundamental to being a coach, you know, that, and and that's the difference between being a coach and someone that downloads a program from the internet and says, here, here you go. Mm-hmm. Um, you need to be able to tap into the individual motivation of the player or the or the athlete, and then be able to get the best out of them. And the only way you can do that is if you can get onto their level, that's because right. as humans, we tend to to work well with people that are like us, mm-hmm. you know, um, and so coaches that can change who they are to get the most out of a player are the best coaches. So I know that the way you would deal with a, uh, a rookie um, that is 
um, battle hardened from from schooling might be different to the way you deal with a rookie who's a bit of a princess and been um, um, fed milk from his mum from an early age and and not really had to deal with too many struggles um, because you understand the meaning and the importance of context right and. And the way you deal with them is very different to the way you deal with someone um, that's been a, a veteran in your organisation or in the sport for 10 years. So getting onto their level by showing them and actually really caring about the individual, that's the thing which I will keep in my mind all the time. Yeah, that, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I, I talked about that at, at the NSCA conference actually about athletes – um, you know, not caring how much you know. And the, really the biggest thing is, 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 you know, one of the things that Coach Dungey with the Bucks, you know, uh, told me early on was, you know, that you've got to take the emotion out of whether or not they're doing the sets, reps, and all, all that. You've got to put the emotion back into developing the time you have with them outside of the weight room, you know. So, you, yeah. you know, they got, you got them for two hours a day. They've got 22 hours to mess up everything you just did. So yeah. if you really want to be a great strength coach, you have to invest in those other 22 hours so that you can you can really not fight in a losing battle, you know, on the when you're seeing them in those two hours. So yeah. uh, I agree with you 100. percent But I know you got to get going, and and uh, you know I, I could talk to you all day, buddy. And, and you know, but we always kind of end these things with a couple of resources. Yeah. Give us a uh, your favorite quote. Something that motivates you that maybe it's plastered up in your weight room? Um, the thing that's on my whiteboard in my wall written in permanent ink is the hotter the flame, the sharper the sword. That's awesome. No, that's, I, I got that one as well. What about a, um, you know, a book? Uh, obviously, well, I'll recommend your book for you because you probably won't do it. But this <laughs> book right here, go get this book. Um, but a, a book that you recommend and... Um, you know, a website and an app recommendation. Um, the book, and this this is not a sports science book or a strength and conditioning book. This is a coaching wisdom book. And I know that in America you've got some unbelievable coaches and books from Lombardi and Walsh and those guys. And our, probably our best coach in Australia is a guy called Wayne Bennett from Rugby League. And his book is one that I read. I make sure I read every day. Uh, sorry, every, every year. And it's... Um, don't die with the music in you, and it is a, a really short read that you'll you'll get through in in a day. What what have we got here? It's two hundred and sixteen very easy pages, and it's just full of quotes, full of full of wisdom from um, probably one of the best coaches Australia's ever had. Oh, that's that's, that's awesome. We picked that up for sure. What about a, a website or a app? The website that I, I look at all the time is one from the, one of the contributors from the book, Joel Jameson. I really like his eight weeks out yeah. website. No, that's a fantastic one. And in terms of the app, um, uh, my, I, I must admit, look, I'm not a huge app guy. Um, I've got a few that I use, but one that I use probably most frequently is the um, the WADA app, W-A-D-A, which is the, the drugs in sports. So we get, uh, we get drug tested all the time and... Um, and for good reason, you know, and sure. so we're, we're always making sure that we are compliant and making sure we're doing the right things. And, and, and also it's really important that the, the athletes have that on their phones as well. So if they go to, um, the pharmacy cause they've got a, a cold, they can check up the, um, the ingredients of their cold and flu preparation and make sure that it's safe. I think that's absolutely critical for, for, um, for any athlete. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, buddy, I, you know, I, you, you've spent a ton of time, and I apologize it's gone for as long as it has. We're going to have to have you back on because I, I've got about 9 million more questions for you, man. But, um, but you've been a stud, and I, I truly appreciate you coming on and, and appreciate the contribution that you've, you've made to uh, the strength and conditioning community with this book and all you do with, with the university and, and, and conferences and all that. But um, truly appreciate it, man. Uh, listen, Ron, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure, and, um, and and thank you so much for all your contribution and, and, and sitting down next to me at UKSCA all those years ago and just saying, hey, coach, and, and it's amazing, you know, how these sorts of things, um, these sorts of relationships evolve, and I always talk about the best thing, as I said, about 
conferences and courses is not the information you learn, it's the people that you meet. And, and my, my life is richer from having met you and, and coaches like you, so it's a real thrill and an honour to be involved. Thanks a lot, buddy. See ya. Cheers. Bye. That's it for this episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk. Thanks to this week's guest as well as our sponsors, EliteForm.com and IgnitionAPG.com for bringing this episode to you for free. Make sure to check out RonMcKeefrey.com where you can join our mailing list, find the show notes, including all the links and resources mentioned, and information about Coach McKeefrey's other products. While you are there, please join Coach McKeefrey in the comments section thanking our guest for sharing. If you haven't subscribed to Iron Game Chalk Talk on YouTube or iTunes yet, make sure to do so. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome. Coach McKeefrey can be found on Twitter at rmckeefrey, on Facebook and YouTube at forward slash ron.mckeefrey. That's it for this week. Be sure to check back next week for another great episode of Iron Game Chalk Talk.